Hello everyone, and welcome to DM Tools with Max McCool. On today's episode of Monsters Manifested, we're going to be covering the Onkeg. So, without further ado, let's get right into it. The Onkeg takes up page 21 of the Monster Manual, and we're going to find out what it's all about. An Onkeg resembles an enormous many-legged insect. It's long antennae twitching in response to any movement around it. Its legs end in sharp hooks adapted for burrowing and grasping its prey, and its powerful mandibles can snap a small tree in half. So already it's given us a bit of imagery here to kind of perceive the Onkeg, and clearly it's insectoid in semblance and how it looks, and it's very, very large with many, many legs. The imagery or the art that's provided on the page, to me at least, makes it seem almost beetle-like. It's got these large mandibles and a hard kind of chitinous-looking shell. But more, more on that later on, I suppose. Moving on. Lurkers in the Earth. The Onkeg uses its powerful mandibles to dig winding tunnels deep beneath the ground. When it hunts, an Onkeg burrows upward, waiting below the surface until its antennae detect movement from above. Then... It bursts from the earth and seizes prey in its mandibles, crushing and grinding while it secretes acidic digestive enzymes. These enzymes help dissolve a victim for easy swallowing, but the onkeg can also squirt acid to take down foes. Pretty interesting. So this is kind of cool. They're, they're explaining how it moves itself about, how it traverses land, but at the same time, they kind of provide a little bit of biological process of what it has to do in order to feed itself effectively since this is though a fantasy creature it's still a what would you call it an insect or animal of any sort you know it has a the the base survival mentality right anyways moving on bane of field and forest although onkegs receive a certain portion of their nutrients from the soil through which they burrow they must supplement their diet with fresh meat. Pastures teeming with grazing livestock and forests rife with game are an Onkeg's prime hunting grounds. Onkegs are thus the bane of farmers and rangers everywhere. Oh, that's great. It lends itself immediately to a quick adventure type thing inside of a, uh, inside of a town or a, a village or even, you know, the outskirts of, let's say, a city or kingdom type thing where there's the, the agricultural areas, right? The serfs or farmers type thing that produce crop and livestock to feed the, the town or city itself. Earthen tunnels. As it burrows through the earth, the Onkeg leaves a narrow, partially collapsed tunnel in its wake. In these tunnels, one might find the remnants of molted Onkeg chitin, hatched Onkeg eggs, or the grisly remains of Onkeg victims including coins or other treasures scattered during the creature's attack. Very cool. So the Onkeg seems pretty well fleshed out in the sense that they don't necessarily go very, very in depth with the Onkeg as a creature or as its history or kind of notable moments in the lore that involved Onkegs, but they, they provide you with some solid characteristics about an Onkeg with its environment, its behavior, and the consequences or results, I suppose, of their actions when they are a factor in the environment. But that does it for the lore. So let's move on to the stat block and see the, the numbers that represent the Onkeg. So the Onkeg's stat block goes as follows. The Onkeg is a large monstrosity with an unaligned alignment. <laughs> it has an armor class of 14, which is natural armor but of 11 while prone. It has an average of 39 hit points or 6d10 plus 6 hit points. It has a speed of 30 feet with a burrowing speed of 10 feet. It has a strength of 17, a dexterity of 11, a constitution of 13, an intelligence of 1, a wisdom of 13, and a charisma of 6. The Onkeg has the sense of dark vision for 60 feet and tremor sense for 60 feet with a passive perception of 11. For those of you who might not be aware, tremor sense is effectively a sensitivity to rumblings and vibrations in the earth. So in the same way that we can feel tremors when an earthquake is about to 
take place or is taking place. You can kind of feel it or even something as simple as a, a large truck driving by the road. You kind of feel the vibration in the ground and through your body. That's effectively what tremor sense is. The Ankeg speaks no languages and has a challenge rating of two. Now onto the actions. Bite. It's a melee weapon attack with a plus five to hit and a reach of five feet on one target. On a hit, it deals an average of nine damage, nine slashing damage that is, or 2d6 plus three, plus an average of three or 1d6 acid damage. If the target is a large or smaller creature, it is grappled, which has an escape DC of 13. Until this grapple ends, the Ankeg can bite only the grappled creature and has advantage on attack rolls to do so. Acid Spray Recharge 6 The Ankeg spits acid in a line that is 30 feet long and 5 feet wide, provided that it has no creature grappled. Each creature in that line must make a DC 13 dexterity saving throw, taking an average of 10 or 3d6 acid damage on a failed save, or half as much damage on a successful one. And that's pretty much it for the Ankeg. So the Ankeg is a pretty simple creature in the way that there's not a, a huge amount of lore or actions and abilities that it has. However, it's oddly very well fleshed out on a fundamental level, which is probably why I enjoy using the Ankeg, because there is enough there to create a structure around the Ankeg as a, as a creature, as a monster for your players to go up against. However, there's not so much predetermined information that you are beholden, let's say, to the limits of what they present. Not that you are anyway, to be completely honest. I think it's the player's handbook or the DMs or the monster man. It could be all of them, but pretty much all the books say like, this is just a guideline of how you can interpret things and how you can use things. It's to be used as a resource. If you choose to use certain aspects of this book and not others or to morph and mutate it to your desires, please do so because this game is about you enjoying the game you enjoy. So there isn't really a need to be so rigid. However, since the basis of this series is for me to create adventures based upon the provided lore, I'm going to be beholden to do just that. <laughs> so let's uh, enough, enough uh, dilly dallying. Let's, let's move on to adventure creation. So immediately I would take the pretty well established potential for an adventure that's already shown in the monster manual, right? So the Ankeg is a large insect with a chitinous shell, you know, resembles a beetle, many legs, long antennae. I would say if any of you are familiar with the Fallout series by Bethesda, an Ankeg looks very much so aesthetically, not so much in size, but an Ankeg looks very much so like the Mirelurk Queen, right? Just large and chitinous or chitinous rather. And it has uh, these kind of claws and pincers and mandibles and spits acid. It's actually a very similar creature. If not, you can see the imagery from the monster manual itself or on Google, stuff like that, and you'll see what I mean. Now, it also says here that the Ankeg uses its mandibles to dig tunnels beneath the ground. So that creates basically a change in environment, which I think could be really interesting. So for an adventure, Let's start out with the typical adventure that seems to present itself to us based on the information provided to us by the monster manual. So it is the bane of farmers and rangers, stuff like that. So let's start it out with the adventurers making their way to a town. This town is suffering through a famine. The reason that the townsfolk are suffering through this famine is because although they are successful in growing crop and livestock, it's all being demolished and consumed and destroyed by some monstrous creature. The town itself, the town guard, they have tried to send people in to take out said creature and deal with it and kind of save the villages or save the farms. But they failed because the guard are perhaps inept or are not armed or trained to deal with the circumstances of a large monstrous creature that can spew acid and has natural armor. So the players go through, they are requested to deal with the Ankeg, and they accept and try to take out the culprit of the town suffering. So this is pretty straightforward of an adventure in that way, but you can kind of 
add some variability to it based on what you would like to see occur and the decisions of your players. So if you have your players work through in an instance where there is a kingdom, let's say, and they're passing through the outer areas of the kingdom, right? Imagine like there's a city center type thing for a modern day comparison. Imagine there's like a city center and then you got the suburbs around like bordering the the, the metropolitan core, right? Imagine it in that way, right? You have a town or a city, a kingdom in the center of this area. And then around it, you have rather than a suburban area, you have agricultural area, you have a farming area. So you can have the players go through and as they're making their way into the town or the city or the kingdom on which they could be traversing through for another reason, perhaps there is another quest. And this is almost like a side quest or a task, if you would like, because side quests and tasks though they are not necessarily as significant as the main quest or the campaign quest, let's say, that you have established or would like to implement for your players, though they are not of that vast scale or significance, does not mean that they are not adventures, right? A side task or a side quest is or can be more than enough to fill a solid session, depending on how long you play. I mean, my players and I on average, we would play something to the tune of eight or nine hour sessions. And some of those eight or nine hour sessions were nothing more than side quests, to be quite honest with you. And I mean, at the end of the day, pretty much all adventures, unless they're the main campaign adventure, are technically side quests because they're quests that must be done or completed in order to progress further to get closer to the main result that is being sought out to complete the campaign. That's neither here here nor there, though. I'm I'm rambling. So the the adventurers make their way through the town. As they're going through the farming area, the agricultural area, before they get through the city gates, let's say, they're approached by farmers or by individuals, perhaps guards patrolling, and seeing if they are willing to assist in dealing with this foul beast that's causing the town to suffer this famine, right? Or this loss of crops and livestock. Now, the reason why I use crops and livestock is because, yes, an onkeg, when it comes up out of the ground, it's hunting animals. It's They eat meat, right? They supplement their diet with fresh meat. They must. Fair enough, right? They receive a certain portion of their nutrients from the soil while they're burrowing through, but they have to supplement their diet with fresh meat. Okay, cool. So they supplement their diet with living animals, in this case, livestock. Why would the crops be destroyed? Well, the crops would be destroyed as well because A, the Ankeg needs to receive the portion of nutrients. So it could be sapping the earth and those nutrients that are being given to the Ankeg through the soil are not being provided to the plant life or plant matter that is being grown. That's one thing. Two, when the Ankeg burrows out from underground to hunt its prey, what ends up happening is they will leave these large collapsed tunnels. They leave these large collapsed tunnels, presumably if it's on farmland and stuff like that, where livestock is, Perhaps they bore out of their tunnels through a field of corn or wheat or something like that, right? So there's destruction of crop as well as just livestock. Remember that you can always use the environment to help set the scene for your adventure, right? And then when you implement that and you use the environment, you then have to rationalize or not necessarily rationalize, but come up with a reason as to why the environment has been affected in such a way. And the Ankeg is great because it is a resource for you to do that. The Ankeg itself can cause destruction to the environment. And it already frames a a clearer picture of what's going on for your players, right? In your players' imaginations. And it adds a little bit more immersion to the world, right? As opposed to, there's a big beetle thing that comes up out of the ground and kills my chickens. Can you stop it, right? And then you have the effect of that failure of agriculture, Failure of livestock means failure of feeding themselves, which means failure of feeding the town, which means failure of health in the town. You see, and there's this kind of domino effect that builds up. So now you have a town that's suffering and starving. Perhaps the king is some fat, spoiled king and, you know, lives his life through excess type thing. He lives to eat versus eating to live and he's not suffering any from it. So what does he care? Because he has six years worth of stores or something like that. And and somehow they don't go bad. Or it could be the opposite. Perhaps you have a caring ruler who is 
concerned about all of this stuff and they don't know how to deal with the onk eggs coming in and kind of destroying their main source of food and nutrients, right? Again, perhaps as a reason for that, trade has become reliable and so the cost of things have has gone up. Things like potatoes and carrots now cost four gold instead of costing four silver because they have to have it shipped in from some neighboring town or something like that, right? But anyhow, you could have an adventure set up where the players are making their way into the town, perhaps for resources to purchase more bolts, arrows, repair their armor, stuff like that. And they pass through this agricultural part of the border of the kingdom and they're approached by some desperate farmers, let's say. And then you can play on that empathy that falls there if your players are inclined to care about that or be empathetic. So you can have a down on their luck farmer show up and and request the assistance of the party to help stop whatever it is that's destroying their their crops and livestock and their livelihood essentially, right? And they approach the party hat in hand and say, you know, we don't have much, but we'll provide you with everything we have in terms of gold or maybe in terms of food or maybe in terms of even things like food for the party's animals, right? Like in terms of maybe food for the party's horses. Perhaps the party has a wagon with some horses on it. Perhaps the party has horses that they ride and they need to feed them or care for them or tend to them. And they say, yeah, no problem. Tell you what, if you can deal with this thing that's causing issues in our town, you'll always have free housing and care for your horses, right? Or for yourselves even. Maybe they'll allow for a place for them to stay. So that's a way you can incentivize the players to do that if they're not so inclined to be necessarily empathetic, let's say. Right? You could also take it the other route and use desperation in the sense of uh, dread and survival, right? Where you have this tyrannical leader who doesn't really care about what's going on and lives a comfortable life themselves anyway, so why would they care about the other people and is actually threatening or is going through with, let's say, executing failed farmers and agriculturalists because they are unable to provide their expected quota or portion of food to the king or queen or emperor or warlord or what have you, nor are they able to provide that for the people. And because of their failure, due to the fact that this person in power is tyrannical, they're controlling with an iron fist. And because they're controlling with an iron fist, they're then creating instances where innocent people are suffering. Now that could even tie into a larger scale, more significant adventure where now the characters or the adventurers have two adventures or two quests effectively set up for them where they have to deal with this nuisance that's destroying the lives and livelihoods of people, of these individuals, these innocent people. And if they so choose to, they have to deal with this fanatical tyrant almost who is executing and killing off these people because they are failing to provide what they have been charged to provide due to the fact that there is something out of their control destroying it or destroying their efforts. You could even flip it another way where you have perhaps a leader that does care, a a queen or king or warlord or emperor or what have you, that does care but doesn't know how to deal with it, doesn't know how to find the solution to it. As I said earlier, maybe the guards are ill-equipped or they're ill-trained, they're not designed for dealing with these kind of large, monstrous animals or creatures, right? So they are kind of beside themselves, they don't know how to deal with it. Well, then you can play the empathy card once again and, and say, hey, perhaps the players would be willing to deal with these issues by request of the person in power or by request of the captain of the guard or by request of the townsfolk. Perhaps the townsfolk have amassed kind of a pot of money or gems or valuables, whatever it is, for whomever it is that can provide them the service of dealing with this monster that's destroying their lives and causing this famine and stuff of that nature. You could also then create instances almost of perhaps a a more physical or real set of consequences, right? So as the players go through the town, it's all kind of in in despair and people seek help. They need them to deal with the onk egg and and stuff of that nature. And they point them towards this tunnel or the, the set of tunnels, let's say. And the players now have to traverse through the tunnel to deal with the onk egg in its den or its nest or or what have you. This could lead to a very interesting process of environment change in the adventure, right? It also creates a very interesting amount of choice for your players because your players can choose to lure out the Ankeg and have it reveal itself from underground. 
and then they have a surface level combat type thing on, on the ground level, or they can traverse through these tunnels into this kind of these dark, musty, kind of haphazardly created caves, right? Like improvised cave systems or tunnel systems and deal with the Ankeg on its home turf. Now that might be a little safer because perhaps the Ankeg's den is not a large space. Perhaps the Ankeg is immobilized to a, to a degree and is unable to move around as freely because it just uses the, the den space to maintain its brood or its clutch of eggs and sleep effectively. It comes up to hunt, it comes up to eat the livestock and stuff like that, or it picks it up and takes it back down. So you could use the tunnel system as almost like a, a clue or, or a murder mystery where you can see skeletons of animals and humans. As it mentioned, you know, perhaps you find some coin and stuff like that. However, maybe due to the acid that can be produced by the Ankeg, perhaps you don't find any bones or skin or anything like that, right? You just, as it said, find these breadcrumbs of chitinous scales and coins, maybe half of a sword that looks like it's been melted off halfway through just to kind of feed your players a few breadcrumbs here and there about what to expect when going up against this creature. Because not only is the Ankeg a large, intimidating monster with a natural armor that protects it from most attack, it is also this entity that can spew out caustic liquid that can hurt really, really bad and destroy things, potentially. Now, it's not statistically established that way, like a rust monster is, let's say, where it states in the stat block that the damage created will destroy or deteriorate the quality of the armor and arms that your adventurers use. No, it doesn't say that, but there's no reason to say that it doesn't do that either. As a DM, you could decide that it, it would do that because it is acid, and that's what acid does. It dissolves, it destroys, it melts things away, right? So that's one way of looking at it, and you can allow your players to have that kind of freedom and mobility in the sense that they can establish a plan where it's either we storm its house and take it out where it resides, or we lure it out and manage to take on the Ankeg on our own terms on our home turf, which either way can work out in very interesting ways. If you use the tunnel example, you can have this combat occur and all of this stuff, and it happens in these close quarters. They might have an advantage when going up against the Ankeg and stuff like that. However, perhaps the combat and the craziness of what's going on and what's happening is disturbing the soil, is disturbing the earth, and perhaps destroying the Ankeg and defeating it and overcoming it, all of that moving about and all that chaos has caused tremors that will cause a collapse in the tunnel. And now your players have to flee the tunnel before it collapses upon them and they all die, a la Indiana Jones with the giant boulder. Inversely, if they're playing on the surface, you could do something similar to that where all the chaos and combat on the surface, after defeating the, the Ankeg, the impact or the force in which it falls and impacts the earth causes a sinkhole to appear and it falls through and your players have to do maybe a deck save or something like that to jump out from the, the radius of the sinkhole that's going to be created. So there's a lot of very interesting ways that you can utilize the environment with an Ankeg. And um, it's amazing to me because Wizards provides very, I don't want to say rudimentary, but it, they provide a very basic and simple description and explanation of an Ankeg and how it affects the environment. And from that, you can kind of branch out into so many different things that are open to your choosing, right? I mean, you could have your players coming into the town, let's say, or going through the forest, even like through the through the woods on their horses. And due to the Ankeg's tremor sense, as they're running through the vibration of all the horses pounding across the earth causes the Ankeg to just spout out from the ground and attack them head on. Perhaps the Ankeg is the aggressor in that situation. You could definitely utilize that as well. You could also create an adventure where it is almost like a monster hunter thing. Perhaps there's a contract out for Ankegs. Perhaps there's a town that has, is known to be historically kind of riddled with Ankegs causing havoc and distress throughout the town. So what the guard has done, or perhaps a mercenary company or some guild of some sort, what they have implemented is they have implemented a bounty system where people that can take out an Ankeg will receive X amount of gold for every, every mandible that they bring in or every pair of mandibles, or perhaps there is an alchemist or a, a merchant or a magician or a wizard or sorcerer of some sort 
who has developed some form of tool or potion or solution or something like that using the acid that an Onkeg produces, then you can have something of value there in terms of a bounty for collecting the venom sack, let's say, of an on of an Onkeg. And then that could lead to some interesting factors as well, because now not only do the adventurers have to defeat and overcome the Onkeg, they have to defeat the Onkeg and overcome it. And they have to do it in such a way that the Onkeg is not so damaged and destroyed that they are unable to acquire things from it that they need, right? So now they have to be a bit more delicate in their approach. They can't just use a hammer and smash through it like it's a lobster claw. They have to be careful and a bit more precise because they don't want to burst anything. They don't want to pop that venom sack because when they go and dissect the thing after killing it to collect the venom sack, it'll be ruined. So there's a lot of consequence here to a fairly apparently simple creature with only a few characteristics that are provided to us. Another great thing is that it's large. So due to the fact that it's large, it can now cover up more space It allows the DM to present scale to the players for the first time in the monster manual that we've seen. So rather than taking up one square on a a battle map, let's say, that represents five feet, it takes up four squares, right? So it is 10 feet by 10 feet. So it's one size larger. It's a larger creature, so you you kind of get that, not necessarily the the, the scale of, let's say, a Godzilla-type creature, but now your players, for the first time in the Monster Manual, they're now going up against something that is, rather than going up against someone that may be very tall, they're now going up against some, someone or something, rather, that is the size of a house, right? That's a lot to take on. And then, once again, you can use the scale and the size of the creature to more accurately come to a conclusion as to how it would potentially affect the environment in the same way, right? So imagine something like that. It's it's not just a little beetle that's coming out of the ground and nibbling at the ankles of your adventurers. It is a gigantic beetle the size of a house tearing a hole, a 10 foot by 10 foot hole, if not greater, out of the earth to accost your players, right? See, it's it's the, the change in scale presents a much more significant sense of of intensity and gravity to the situation. But you could also use the Onkeg after the fact, after their success, right? You could use the success of the players defeating the Onkeg and collecting its mandibles or its venom sack or something like that as a means of perpetual gain, right? Perpetual gold gain or as perpetual gratitude from the townspeople. And as I mentioned before, with, you know, perhaps the farmers or the townsfolk providing them with free food and board while they're there because they're protecting them or they've chosen to protect them or defend them or deal with the issue that they have. I mean, you could even create an adventure within that tunneling system that the Onkeg has, because where did that Onkeg come from? Was the Onkeg hatched there? Was there always an Onkeg there that laid eggs and then produced another clutch of onk eggs and those onk eggs stuck around and just kept consuming things because the cycle was there. People kept farming there, which means they kept having livestock there, which means the onk egg kept having food there. Or did the onk egg come from somewhere and decided to reside in that area because of the perpetual food supply? You could also even more so do that in the way of adventurers going through the woods or the forest, right? Because they find a tunnel, perhaps they find a cave, they traverse through, and they see that there's an onkeg there. Now you've changed the environment from a wooded area, which is, I'll say, typical for a lot of fantasy adventures, into this underground kind of dangerous mine shaft tunnel experience, right? Then you can have them traverse through the tunnel for who knows how long. And when they come up out of the tunnel, wherever the next surface area is, There's a whole new space that they're unfamiliar with where you can change things at a 90 degree angle, totally different from what they were used to experiencing just because they traveled X amount of distance or miles or feet or what have you, whatever your unit of measurement is. And now perhaps they've gone from a forest to fields. Perhaps they've gone to a mountain range. Perhaps they've gone to a desert and they didn't see any change in the environment. It's a stark contrast because they've been underground for who knows how long. And that can open you up to the next set of adventures for your next session. Anyway, that's everything I have for the Onkeg. That's really everything that comes to mind at the moment in terms of an adventure and and scenarios in which you could implement an Onkeg in your adventures for your players. I highly recommend trying the Onkeg out. It's a great creature. It's very interesting and it's a great creature to use as food for thought for an adventure and as a tool to use to expand maybe your idea of how an adventure can play out. 
and the results of things, kind of the splash damage, let's call it, that occurs from the presence of this creature. I think Wizards did a really good job in describing, defining, and implementing the Onkeg. Even though it's kind of a cursory surface level explanation of it, there is enough there that it allows you to comprehend and understand what it does. And it's open enough that you can build upon it and kind of tune it to work as you would like it to work out for your adventure. But either way, that's it for me, folks. Thank you very much for listening. Next episode of Monsters Manifested, we'll be covering the Azure. Very interesting. I've always wanted to use an Azure, but I have not yet. Or Azure, I think it might be. But we'll continue that next week. Thanks again for tuning in, and have a good day, everyone. <laughs>